Dear friends, come on in and make yourself comfortable. We are asking folks to come down um, toward the front so that we can be close to one another. That's fine. I want to welcome all of you to a very important evening with Rabbi Dr. Rachel Sabbath Beit Halachmi. I'll introduce her formally in just a moment. First, though, as always, <coughs> I want to thank our program committee, many of whom are here tonight. The committee is chaired by Dr. Claudia Platel, and of course, it's aided by our executive director and Skirball Center director, Dr. Mark Weistuck, our administrator, Mark Heitlinger, and our librarian, Liza Stabler, who unfortunately is under the weather and couldn't be here. Tonight, we are continuing our series on the history and future of Reform Judaism. This past fall, with Rabbi Dr. David Ellenson, now the chancellor of the Hebrew Union College, and Rabbi Dr. Gary Zola, executive director of HUC's American Jewish Archives, we discussed the 19th century emergence of a uniquely American Reform Judaism. And Dr. Ellenson will return to us in April to explore Reform Judaism's development through the 20th century. And then in May, Rabbi Rick Jacobs, president of our reform movement, and Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pankin, the new president of the College Institute, will together debate and consider the future of Reform Judaism in our new and changing world. Tonight, though, we renew the conversation with particular focus. Over the next three weeks, we're going to be exploring in depth some of our movement's core tenets as we consider the meaning of Israel and the diaspora, the prophetic mandate for universal justice and the Jewish commitment to all of humanity, and the place of the God idea in contemporary Jewish life. Next Wednesday, March 5th at 6.30, our topic will be social justice, the heart and soul of the past and future of the reform movement. And Rabbi David Saperstein, director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, and Al Vorspan, for years our movement's vice president and social action director, will inspire us as the two of them can so beautifully. The following Wednesday, March 12th at 6.30, with leading theologian Dr. Ellen Umansky, we will explore how liberal Jews create paths toward the sacred, the development of a liberal Jewish theology in America. Tonight, as you know, our topic is Israel and peoplehood in Reform Jewish thought. The complex relationship between Israel and world Jewry has engaged Reform Jewish leaders since our movement's birth and since this congregation's founding. In August 1897, when Theodore Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress, the most prominent American rabbi to attend was our own Gustav Gottheil, founder of the Federation of American Zionists, the precursor to the ZOA. Rabbi Judah Magnus, before going on to build the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, invited Henrietta Zold to an Emanuel Women's Study Group, which in 1913 birthed Hadassah, whose first mission underwritten by our member, Nathan Strauss, was to provide for the medical needs of the early Chalutzim. Rabbi Julius Mark was an ardent Zionist, and one of the galvanizing forces in world Jewry's support of the Yeshuv was Emmanuel's president, Louis Marshall, founding chairman of the Jewish Agency. This is our history. The support for Am Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael have been a hallmark here. And yet from those early years, debates abounded about how central Israel ought to be to our identity, and the very nature of the state the Chalutzim hoped to build. The latter debate was captured in exchanges between Rabbi Magnus and Chaim Weizmann, and many questions were asked by others in America's early reform leadership. Was North America the new Zion and Judaism to be just a religion? Could American Jews embrace the possibilities of a Jewish democratic state without succumbing to the dangers and tensions of dual loyalty? Tonight, we explore the development of our reform Jewish Zionist thought that brought us to the full and passionate embrace of Israel as elemental to our definition as Jews that our movement espouses today. And we do so with one of our movement's truly great teachers. Rabbi Dr. Rachel Sabbath Beit Halachmi serves now as the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion's National Director of Recruitment and Admissions and as its president scholar. 
She also heads the Office of Community Engagement. Prior to this recent appointment, Rabbi Sabbath served as Vice President of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. For over a decade, she taught as a member of the Institute's faculty and directed the Hartman Lay Leadership, Rabbinic Leadership, and Christian Leadership programs. She remains there a senior fellow. Ordained at HUCJIR nearly 20 years ago, Rabbi Sabbath also earned a PhD from the Jewish Theological Seminary. She writes a monthly column in the Jerusalem Post and has co-authored two books and published numerous articles, which I know a number of you have read. She also teaches and mentors students of HUC and speaks throughout North America on leadership, Israel, gender, and theology. And she's currently writing a book on the future of covenant for Jewish peoplehood. Rabbi Sabbath is an alumna of the Wexner Foundation Graduate Fellowship and is a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. She served on the faculties of the Wexner Foundation, CLAL, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership, and our own Skirball Center. For more than a decade, she also served as the rabbi of Congregation Shirat Hayam on Nantucket. Raised in Minneapolis, Rabbi Sabbath lived in Israel for nearly 15 years and currently lives in Cincinnati with her husband, Rabbi Ofer Sabbath Beit Halachmi, and their three children. Ladies and gentlemen, it is really a joy to welcome one of our movement's great lights, Rabbi Dr. Rachel Sabbath Beit Halachmi. Thank you, Rabbi Davidson. Really, my job now is to find more people like your rabbi to serve the Jewish people in the future. And what I've learned from our research, because actually one of us, a few people have been asking me about it uh, uh, just a few moments ago, what I've learned from very recent sociological research is that actually it's people like you who have at least as much impact on a young person's career decisions uh, as do their rabbis. Uh, is it a family business? Sometimes, uh, and uh, very much so in other cases. Um, so I really just want to thank you, Rabbi Davidson, for this wonderful invitation. I'm quite honored uh, to be here, and I will speak a little bit more about the future toward the end of my remarks. I'm honored to be here for a number of reasons. Uh, one, of course, is this is really the founding institution of all questions of American Judaism. Historically, as Rabbi Davidson laid it out before you, in fact, you've saved me a big part of my introduction by your wonderful introduction, so thank you. Uh, and I know that all of you are very well read uh, on these issues and on the history of your synagogue, but I'm particularly interested on, about this topic here because, in fact, your rabbis have been on radically different sides of this question over the history of this institution, as you know, but also during their own lives. So I actually think some of the great leadership of this institution, and we'll look at some of their texts in a moment, are actually important intellectual symbols of the ways in which this issue, the question of Israel, Zionism, and Jewish peoplehood, is actually among all the issues that you're studying, perhaps the most interesting. It's the issue on which your rabbis have actually changed their minds. They've been non-Zionist, I wouldn't say anti-Zionist, but they've been very vocally non-Zionist in parts of their lives, and later on down the line actually very much changed their opinion. So this is an institution which also can allow for the true intellectual and religious and ideological development of some of the most important ideas. So I'm very honored to have this opportunity to be here in this sacred institution. Uh, also, of course, I was ordained here nearly 20 years ago, so for that reason it will always be a very much a sacred space uh, for me in my own rabbinic story. Uh, and lastly, having been part of the founding Skirball faculty, in fact, I'm very much attached to what this institution has been able to do in terms of Jewish intellectual life for the community and the commitment to Hebrew and the commitment to the study of all ideas. So I'm very honored to be here. <clears throat> this great debate about who we are actually, I think, is best understood through the lens of this question. Who are we? Are we a religion? Are we a religious community? Are we a culture? Are we, as the great thinker Mordechai Kaplan claimed, a civilization? Are we a nation? Are we a people? 
Are we a political entity? And if, as many scholars might argue in different periods of time, we are more one than the other, they have always had to wrestle with the interplay of the other aspects of who we might be and who we have been. So I want to draw a sort of a broad picture for you and argue that we are actually entering now a fourth phase of what I'll call reform Zionism. So I hope you'll join me. You all have the texts, correct? You all got them on the way in. So I hope you'll join me. And because we're a relatively uh, small group, I'm also hoping that we can really have some engaged conversation along the way and understand uh, that this is certainly a space where all and any questions uh, can be asked. I also understand this to be really an institution and a question about which the training of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religions uh, professionals, rabbis, cantors, educators, uh, Jewish nonprofit professionals, can, and scholars are all actually being trained to understand these questions as they emerge. And today, Specifically today, there was actually an announcement made. I don't know if you saw it in the, in the various uh, Jewish newspapers, but particularly it was announced in the Jerusalem Post, um, the creation of a Jewish service corps to be actually led by the Jewish agency. So what that will mean for Zionism in terms of the particular and the universal questions, we're going to be coming back to you, but it's certainly very much uh, a question that will be pursued very differently in the future. So let's, let's explore some texts together, and then I will pose some questions to you. The overreaching question, of course, is who are we? A religion, a nation, a people, a civilization? It will be my argument that, in fact, in Judaism, and those of you who've, uh, who've been my colleagues and students know that I very much believe, and clearly you hear it in my biography, I actually believe that to have one of those pieces missing in your Jewish identity is to have an impoverished Jewish identity today. That we live in a time where all of those aspects of what it means to be Jewish, one can pursue, one can understand, one can take a whole variety of different positions, but to actually miss out on one is to be impoverished in some way. And feel free to argue with me as we move uh, to our discussion period. Each of our thinkers here today are actually going to be approaching this question through different lenses. Obviously, and as you know, and as you, you heard already, each of the thinkers presented here are approaching this set of questions through the lenses of certainly their historical context, the context that they were in politically, historically, um, but I will argue there's also very much a deep sense of theology behind many of their positions. And as you know, not particularly the text study that we're engaging in uh, this evening, but as you know, the positions that our theologians have taken on these questions of the place of Israel, the land of Israel, the state of Israel, has had enormous impact on our prayer books. If you would study, as many of you probably have with uh, with Rabbi Professor Ellenson, you'll actually see the ways in which, depending on the lens that you see this question, will be how you pray or don't pray, the direction in which you pray, what prayers you pray, and how you understand theologically your own relationship to the land. But we'll certainly <clears throat> come back to all of these questions in a moment. So if we were to draw a broad historical framework, I would say there's the Zionism. The first phase would be the Zionism of the book of Genesis. What do we learn in the book of Genesis? The creation of really Judaism. We have the first two Abraham created in Genesis 12. And what the, what's the command to him? Lech lecha. That actually part of the chosenness and being called by God to be a Jew is directly connected to going to a particular place. It's not that one could have become a Jew and founded the Jewish people anywhere, God actually called him lech lecha ma'artzacha to go to a particular land and place. All of the absurdities of the rest of the prophecy and the rest of the blessing we can come back to in a moment, but the Zionism of the book 
of Genesis is a Zionism which is about uh, a, a wandering family, but a family that is deeply connected to a particular land, to the land of Israel. And I want to be very specific about it. <clears throat> Not sovereignty, per se, but a clear establishment of a people and a nation in a particular place. That would be phase one, where Judaism, by the way, uh, don't forget, it's Judaism without Torah. It's actually Judaism in many ways pre-peoplehood. It's very tribal, familial are all those stories of the family. So I would call that phase one. Phase two would really be the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus obviously engages us as a people, engages us with God, God the Redeemer, and takes us certainly to Mount Sinai and to Revelation. So it's the creation of people and the, and the emergence of Torah. So we already see what's happened. We already actually have a radical historical narrative going on in terms of the transformations of who we are vis-a-vis -vis God and who we are vis-a-vis -vis the land. Because where does the Exodus take place? not in the land. Where does revelation take place? Not in the land, in the desert outside the land. And the book of Exodus certainly has us wandering in and out of the land and there seems to be a desire certainly to get there, but it's not entirely sure that we will get there. The rest of the Bible is the story, I would call it the story, this third phase of return and being dispersed, returning and dispersion, returning and dispersion repeatedly throughout that last part of uh, the Torah and of the entire Bible. And that story of wandering keeps us, I would say, wandering and wondering about our sovereignty, but there's a clear sense of religion and there's a clear sense of nation. But the sense of whether or not we really are meant to and can hang on to the idea of sovereignty and statehood remains a question. A fourth phase, are you with me? Should we review? No? Should I test them, Rabbi Davidson, at the end? No, okay. <laughs> a review, a fourth phase would be, right, we've got Genesis, Exodus, what I'm calling the returning and dispersing of the third phase. The fourth phase is really the phase of the various uh, experiences of the diaspora and of very clear, hardcore nationalist approach to Israel and to the land of Israel, and that's the emergence of early Zionism, long before we even have a state, and the question of whether or not in modernity the Jewish people, as it has become, really a community of faithful and not faithful religious people, are actually capable of being a modern nation. And I do ask that as a, as a question. Certainly it was a source of great, great debate all over the world throughout the Zionist movement. The Zionists, by the way, and your rabbis included, were, and the non-Zionists were, the Zionists were a minority. They were the crazy ones. They were the crazy ones. And that's why I think very prominent rabbis initially weren't so eager to join what seemed like a radical, crazy movement. It was really only as things become, became more and more difficult for Jews all over the world, um, and actually I would say even less clear for Jews in North America as well, it was only really in that period and in encountering some of the great Zionist leaders that some of your rabbis and the non-Zionist rabbis of, of Reform Judaism realized that this was a very important uh, response to the Jewish question of what was going to become of the Jewish people in a period of increasing anti-Semitism. So that fourth period is really what I will call nationalist Zionism, okay? So we've got Genesis, Exodus, returning and dispersing, nationalist, and now we have found ourselves in a new phase. I can't call it post-Zionist, and I won't call it post-Zionist, because I think the phase we're in currently is not at all about being post-Zionist in the way that many philosophers and major critics of Israel would understand that. But I, I think it is not the nationalist Zionist movement, but a question of what Zionism as a set of values can mean for the Jewish people 
is the phase that we're in today. So I'll call it the Zionist values era of Judaism and of the Jewish people. And it is quite a source of tension and debate. And what's most important, I think, for all of us to remember and appreciate today is that what's unique to our movement, I would say, is the capacity from the 1830s until today to be able to hold within it a plurality of opinions, pluralism, that you can have people within our movement in the 1830s and today who have very, very different they love to argue with each other. Sometimes we even stop speaking with each other. But we are, we are able to be within the same movement and even sometimes serve the same synagogues with very, very different senses of what Zionism and Israel <clears throat> excuse me, should be, and I will say could be, today. So we're in a period of what I will, maybe I should call a Zionist uh, renaissance or renewal of Judaism. But I'll get back to why I call it that in a moment. Let's look at some of your texts before you. Um, your first text, of course, stands out so uh, prominently because it is, I love it when a rabbi can actually say everything they mean in one sentence. You have to appreciate that, right? So this, uh, this great rabbi, one of our, our early, early leaders, uh, to have Temple Beth Elohim in Charleston, in no, none other than Charleston, South Carolina. What does he say about America? In 1841, mind you, okay? This country is our Palestine. This city, our Jerusalem. This house of God, our temple. Now, what I love about this phrase is that you can find almost the exact phrase in some of the Christian leaders' preaching of the same period. That argument of what America is and can be religiously for somebody could be made by a rabbi and could be made by a Purit Puritan Christian leader at the same time. That is phenomenal in and of itself to understand America as the Jerusalem and this house of God, our temple. You see in it, of course, the makings of everything that happened to our prayer book and to our ideology at that time period. And you, you, you can see it play itself out in our different uh, platforms and uh, statements of principle. But before we get there, one of your great rabbis, Gustav Gottheil, were they all called Gustav, do you think? Apparently, that was the popular name. It was jo Josh of the time. And... Uh, and he's, he's, he's one of your great rabbis in 1893. Actually, so we're jumping over the principles in your order. And he says it even, uh, I think, even more clearly in terms of what the problem is. Palestine is no longer our country. Our country, that title appertains to the land of our birth or adoption. And our nation is that nation of which we form a part and with the destinies of which we are identified to the exclusion of all others. For most early reform thinkers, the problem with Zionism was a problem of nationalism. And it was a problem that was so true to that period of modernity and of nationalism emerging all over, uh, all over Europe and all over the world that it was clear that one could only have one nation of identity that the Jews of Europe, the Jews of France were being questioned over different periods of time. To which nation are you going to be most loyal? If you think of the uh, Napoleonic Sanhedrin for, Sanhedrin, for example, if, you're, if there's a conflict of interests, are you going to support France against your brethren in, in Germany? If there's a conflict between America and whatever this crazy new country in Zion is going to be, are you going to be more supportive of America or more supportive of Israel? That issue of dual loyalty being a problem, I would say, was not solved really until Louis Brandeis and Henrietta Zold, who you referred to earlier, the founder of Hadassah, uh, and Brandeis, uh, the great judge and leader of American Zionism, that issue of, of knowing that a Jew could be a faithful American and a Zionist was really not solved until we're in between World War I and World War II. But before we get there, back to the, uh, the 1800s, 
You see how these rabbis' ideas are being reflected now in the CCAR is coming together and making statements uh, during a number of different periods about where we stand when it comes to this question. <clears throat> so we recognize in the modern era of, listen very carefully to the language, of universal culture of heart and intellect, the approaching of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among all men. We consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community, and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine, nor a sacrificial worship under the sons of Aaron, nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish state. That was when our platforms were actually much more concise than they are today. Very clear, and you can see already, and you've felt in your various prayer books, even that you've known here in this sacred place, how the shift in attention away from Palestine as both a land as a place where the temple, we're no longer interested in a temple or a sacrificial cult, and we're no longer interested in any of the laws concerning the state of Israel, right? So it's the creation, really, a radical creation of a new Judaism. If you would ask most Orthodox Jews then and now, is this Judaism without these things? It is almost inconceivable. But if you take American reform and certainly being influenced by Abraham Geiger and all of the great founders of Reform Judaism in Europe, you can, I hope, very easily understand how this was their position. To become fully American was to become very focused on this nation. To become fully American was also to be focused on this land as a sacred space. And to become fully modern was to let go of all of those arcane and irrational rituals that made us look and sound and feel to our neighbors as being so different. We'll come to the issue of being potentially unethical, but also of being so different and so from this backward place and time that you can imagine that somebody who wanted to become American also wanted to let go of all of those things. And this institution, in a way, symbolized that for a long period of time as well. So you let go of the land, you let go of an idea of any of the language of a reestablishment of a sacrificial cult, and you let go of any of the laws that orient us toward the land of Israel, and you've really created a new Judaism. Fast forward to a period of American reform pro-Zionism. I'm calling that non-Zionism and not anti-Zionism, because in the period of those reform leaders, uh, like Gautheil and one of your other rabbis, uh, Silverman, there was the minute they encountered some of the, not the minute, but in the period that they encountered uh, Herzl and some of the leaders of the Zionist movement and even attended some of the Zionist uh, congresses and conferences, they very much became engaged in what the Zionist movement could do for the Jewish people. They weren't ready until very recently. In fact, I would say maybe even among us colleagues today, we still might have some disagreement, but they weren't ready for it necessarily to change their own practice or our own liturgy here in our prayer books, but they were understanding of the Zionist movement as a humanitarian effort for the Jewish people. Right? That's what Zold was doing. Zold, by the way, actually wanted to join, initially wanted to join Brandeis and bring a woman's movement together with the American Zionist movements. And Brandeis said to her, no. This was after Hadassah had established itself as being a very significant uh, fundraising arm of the Jewish people in terms of raising money for the, uh, the Jewish settlements in Palestine. Um, but really at that moment, that's when uh, Zold realized she had to found uh, Hadassah as very much a humanitarian organization. And it went on, one might even argue, it went on to, be, to do greater things even for the people of Israel and the state of Israel to this very day um, than might have emerged uh, had Brandeis been more comfortable unifying the men's and the, and the women's movements then. 
that might be an argument to maintain our brotherhoods and our sisterhoods. In the, right? I think it might be a very interesting, uh, important argument. Uh, but that's a separate lecture, gender and reform Judaism. So now we're going to fast forward beyond that non-Zionist era of reform leadership. And we find ourselves already by 1975 in a very clearly activist, pro-Zionist reform Judaism. Right now, listen to how radically different the language is. And in both eras, you'll hear the shift in theology. Now, says Alexander Schindler, Zichron Oli Vracha, who's the president of the UHC, which later becomes the URJ, we are all of us Jews, and whether we use the small z or the large z, we are all of us Zionists. So you hear that there's a, a question about that word, and he's making it very clear where he stands and where Reform Judaism stands. The land of Israel, which is Zion, and the children of Israel who constitute the Jewish people and the God of Israel are all bound together in a triple covenant. At no time in our history have we ever stopped praying or longing or working for Zion. Now, I don't think in the texts we read earlier and in this text, you can hear a greater shift in ideology about any single idea. We went from an almost a total rejection about that return to an absolute embrace to the extent to which we're calling it part of a triple covenant, which sounds much more like what most traditional ideas, ha uh, traditional thinkers have in terms of the land and the place of the land of Israel in Jewish theology. We're all, all are bound together in a triple covenant. And what I love about his last line, and what I love, it's actually uh, just last week celebrated his 90th birthday uh, to 120. He should live in strength uh, and in good health. Uh, but in his main theological work, Renewing the Covenant, he says something that I think is very important, very challenging, and very much true to where I think rabbinic leadership is in the phase that we're in now. And here's what he says. Despite all that the state of Israel means to us and has done for us, there is a compelling Jewish and human distinction between its claiming our deep devotion and serving as our actional absolute. As a matter of Jewish principle, no political entity deserves being so exalted, not the kingdoms of Israel and Judah in biblical times, I just lost my next page. Hang on. Not the United States of America, where love of flag often serves to cover its failings, nor either the state of Israel. He's making a very important argument. When he says actional abs absolute, he's following a line of thinking about how uh, and whether Reformed Jews understand God as that which can be absolutely commanding. And what he's doing is uh, actually doing a, an important move for all of us, which is distinguishing between love of country and commitment and being uh, moved and devoted and whether or not it is an actional absolute, meaning regardless and no matter what that political entity does, it determines our action in an absolute uh, philosophical fashion. And what he's arguing is that deep in our tradition, because I want to be very careful about the argument here since you have it slightly out of context, deep within our tradition is both the need for, the right to sovereignty, and yet the understanding that sovereign nations have to be distinguished from the theological idea of God, which should be our actional absolute. And that political commitment should be distinguished from absolute, ultimate religious commitment. That one can be committed to a state and one can also be critical of it. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But I think this is very representative of where our rabbinate is today. 
a deep devotional commitment, and yet the capacity to also withstand in our, uh, I hate to use this term, but I think it's very accurate for Reform Judaism, a very, very broad tent of being able to distinguish between Israel's right to exist and yet our capacity to also be at times critical of a government. So I want to now try to separate what I think got completely lost in all of these transitions, which is a distinction between the spiritual theological connection between the Jewish people and Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, versus our political nationalist commitment to Medinat Israel, the state of Israel. Reformed Jews today have been quite absolutely, largely until recently, very committed to the state of Israel. I would say we didn't continue to develop our theological understanding of the land of Israel as we got swept up in our Zionist commitment and our building of our institutions, our kibbutzim, our near 30 congregations uh, in the state of Israel, and we failed to continue to develop our theological and spiritual relationship to Eretz Israel at the same time. So I think that's a very uh, interesting blurring as that shift took place. Finally, and I'll just leave this for your, um, for your study so we can move to a period of, the, of questions and discussion. What you have in the last uh, set of texts, which I encourage you to read, is some commentary on more recent principles of Reform Judaism, and you have here what I'll call classical Reform Zionism. Okay? It's classical Zionism, but it's not classical Reform. Okay, it's classical reform Zionism. We're committed to the state of Israel, right? It's the, you're going to hear the state, the state, the state, the state. We're committed to reform Jewish values. We're committed to universal, I'm just summarizing what you'll see here. We're committed to universal principles, to humanitarian values for all those uh, who dwell in the land and in the region. We're committed to our institutions. We become very denominationally committed to the state of Israel. We are, as we speak, deep, deeply, uh, very deeply and powerfully involved in political discussions in the state of Israel and with the government of Israel. And it was really Schindler that first took on that leadership role vis-a-vis -vis the state of Israel. Uh, Rick Jacobs is certainly carrying it out. He is engaged with the government of the state of Israel over this question of women of the wall and a and a third uh, area for pluralistic prayer at the State of Israel in a, in a way that I think was unpredictable even five years ago, that a reform leader would be that involved and that crucial. We'll come back to what that means in a moment as well. You have here a clear commitment to Hebrew as a living, as a living language. And again, uh, it's focusing on the people uh, as in addition to the texts. And then, as its final piece here, and with this I'll move toward a conclusion, is this question of what the mutual relationship and impact is in this new era. In this new era, we have what I will call a period of mutual upholding. It's less about our Zionist political commitment, although Certainly, I would say Israel is in need of that politically. But as reform religious Jews, what we're seeing is a mutual upholding through the relationship between our Israeli, uh, our Israeli movement and our American movement. We're seeing a lot of what I will call, quite honestly, almost the, uh, um, akin to intermarriage. I quite literally, as you might gather from my name, even am, am in one of those intermarriages, which is we're so engaged in the world of Israel and Israelis that we have a lot of Americans married to Israelis. We have a lot of Israelis coming back and forth and living in America. We have a lot more Americans going back and forth to Israel all the time. We have a total intermingling of relationships and personalities and leadership. As you know, since the 1970s, all of our um, students, uh, rabbinic cantoral and education now, spend a whole entire year engaged with the people, the land, the language, the state. And even when missiles are falling, 
and the pressure is enormous on the president of the Hebrew Union College, David Ellenson, during the Intifada. And horrible, horrible things are coming, and the pressure is enormous to say, don't make that a requirement. Don't make our students spend a year there in that situation. And his Zionist stance of standing behind that and saying, actually, no. To be a Jewish leader is about standing with the Jewish people in the land and the state of Israel no matter what. That stance of a president of the Hebrew Union College is also representative of this new era, which I will call a total commitment and a total mutual upholding. What's about to happen is that Israeli rabbinic students, we've had a few, but Israeli rabbinic students are now about to be spending um, more and more time in North America. So the uh, interchange and exchange and mutual upholding will continue. I believe that this has enabled us to reach this new phase. This intermingling and this ability to actually live and understand each other has led to a challenging and a transformation in both directions. The amount to which our colleagues are influenced by Israelis in terms of our prayer books and our thinking and our politics is enormous. I hate to think about where reform rabbis would be politically today were it not for the Year in Israel program, for example. The impact of two generations of religious and educational leadership having lived in Israel, even for a year or even for a small period of time, has had a huge impact. So we're in this period where we're able to challenge each other's spirituality. We're able to challenge each other politically. We're engaging in each other's liturgies. There are liturgies of American Reform, Zionism, Reform Judaism that are in the Israeli prayer books, and there's a lot of Israeli impact on our newest liturgies. So there's a wonderful mutual upholding. I believe that as we move forward, we should certainly continue to challenge, inspire, we may at times infuriate each other. Not just because it will, I believe we should do this, not just because it will make us, I hope, politically and morally better in all that we do, because, but because I actually believe it has and can make us more of what we are particularly chosen to do in the world, which is to be of great universal and eternal significance as a people. Thank you. Please, please. <laughs> I'll do my best, yeah. Uh, sh well, there are two union prayer books. There are three, actually. <laughs> um, what you have in, in terms of the historical development of reform prayer is you have initially the removal of even a, a, a small phrase uh, of praying for rain at the time when we have traditionally prayed for rain in the land of Israel. American Reform Judaism initially let that go entirely. There are places in our prayer book where we're um, talking about the ingathering from the four corners of the earth to Zion. Early Reform liturgists removed those phrases from the prayer book. Um, and certainly, uh, still today, to some degree, we have removed um, from our prayer books the liturgies that deal with the rebuilding of the temple and the return to a sacrificial cult as our vision of a messianic time. So those are those three, I think, very significant areas where in the Union prayer book you don't see those in uh, in place, and, and think about them for a moment. The praying for rain in the land of Israel is to be attached to the land and attached to the biblical idea that mitzvot and ethical behavior will bring, bring rain in its time. So the modern, the modern Reformed Jew really disliked that for two reasons. One, as a modern person, do we really believe that prayer and good behavior will bring rain in its season? And the second reason is, as you heard from our, our early voices, 
we're not really connected to that place and that land and those seasons. I remember thinking about this a great deal as a kid growing up in Minnesota on Tubishvat. Now try to plant a tree in Minnesota in the middle of February. In Minnesota. It made absolute no sense to me. I mean, it was the most ridiculous, absurd thing. Uh, I probably think that was one of the times I got thrown out of religious school uh, for saying it was silly. And uh, see what happens to the kid who gets thrown out of religious school? Take note. Uh, no, I got thrown out. Of, the, the worst time I got thrown out was when I, uh, it was about this time of the year, I think. Purim. Did you get thrown out of religious school? No, you were probably better behaved. I don't know. <laughs> It was around this time of the year, and we were about to read the Megillah, the Scroll of Esther, again. We did that last year. Didn't we do that? I think I was like in fourth or fifth grade, actually. And I said, why do we have to read the same stupid story every year? And the teacher um, threw me out of class, uh, but very wisely sent me to the principal's office. And the principal told me that that was an, a very important statement and question. And that began a long set of conversations about the meaning of what it means to read the same story over and over again and what we see in it and what we understand uh, in it. And I would say, actually, I've probably spent the rest of my life rereading those stories and understanding that question uh, better and trying to answer it better, certainly for the next generation. Uh, but in Minnesota, that planting of the tree on Tubishvat at that time of the year is absurd. You have to be theologically deeply engaged with another place in order for any of our biblical agricultural ideas to make any sense. But go spend a year or any time of year in Israel at Pesach, at Passover, or at Tu Bishvat, or on Sukkot, and all of a sudden, all of those ideas and those prayers make absolute sense. Now come and hang out in Manhattan and try to maintain that sense of connection to another place. Our people, I would say, has been strengthened and challenged constantly by our capacity to dwell in multiple places at the same time. Modern nationalism didn't allow for that. Pre-modern existence and post-modern existence absolutely allows for that. So you won't see that uh, multiple existence of being in Manhattan, but also being in the land of Israel as you pray. You won't see that in the, in the Union prayer book. You won't see it in the, any of them, and you won't see it in the new Union prayer book. But you will see it all over the place in Mishkan Tefillah. Right? And Mishkan Tefillah is precisely representing the move from Schindler forward to what, what it was represented by Schindler forward to now Rick Jacobs and David Ellenson and certainly uh, our president, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pankin, that absolute and total theological and political commitment to the land of Israel. So that was a long answer, but I hope you, that was, a, did that give you a sense? If you were really to study these things, you'll, you'll see this total disappearance and then a total reappearance of the ingathering and the idea of Zion, but still I'm relieved to inform you that it does not look like we are at this moment leaning toward an embrace of a rebuilding of the temple or the sacrificial cult. So I hope you're all relieved by that. Um, but it's interesting to imagine, right? Those other two aspects were just as unbelievable in the 1840s, right? All three were unbelievable, and look how much we've shifted. Other questions, yeah? Question of 
Excellent. Uh, those are four questions. Is he allowed to do that? It's like Pesach, right? <laughs> no, they're four excellent questions, actually. The, um, can I answer them in reverse order? <laughs> no, they're excellent questions. No, no, I love it. I love it. Um, so maybe I'll pick two and we'll, we'll continue our, our conversation. Uh, diaspora. If there's a center, anything outside of it is dispersion. We only recently no longer live in that reality. So the fact that you can sit here and be interested in this conversation and not like that word is quite recent. Because only recently, um, well, you had two choices. If you were in the, in the 19th century, you wouldn't like the word because here is Zion. This is Zion. Or you could be in Frankfurt, too, and have said, as they did, uh, here is Zion. In fact, the great philosopher Hermann Cohen uh, argued that the future of the Jewish people was in Germany and that there was Zion. Reform and Orthodox rabbis made that claim about Germany. But if here is where you are is Zion, then you're not in the diaspora. And then what do you make of Zion? Zion becomes... Well, maybe your poor brother or cousin that you might put a few coins in the blue and white box for, but it doesn't become your center. It becomes, you know, in the language of federation, a, um, you know, a foreign concern, right? What do we call those in federation terminology? Federation leadership, what do you call them? They're the, there's the local and the, uh, and I think they call it the foreign uh, concerns. Anyway, so then Israel just becomes one of them. But we live in a very interesting situation sociologically right now, which is why this announcement of the Jewish Service Corps, the Global Jewish Service Corps, is so interesting to me. Uh, and it's truly a follow-up to birthright. We live now in a time of bi-centrist Judaism. Right? If, if Chad Ha'am could argue that there's a center of Zion, and that there would be spokes leading out from it all over the Jewish world, and we would have this kind of mutual, the term that I use is the mutual upholding, we would have a mutual impact on each other, but there would be a center and emanating from it light and inspiration, and of course, ki mitzion Torah, right, and ideas. That would be the, the Zionist and religious idea about the centrist position of, uh, central position of Zion. But we live in an age where actually just about everything that's true about Zion is also true about Manhattan. Jerusalem and New York. We have actually two centers of the Jewish people, both in terms of population. If you think about North American Jewry and Israel, Israeli Jewry, we have some of the same actual issues of struggles uh, about how to understand ultra-Orthodox Judaism and its impact, but we live in a non, uh, I would say in a, in a post-diaspora world today. Um, but that will lead me back to your first question, which is Zionism is about political sovereignty. So I feel that I can apply that term in a pre-Zionist sense, but I'm, I'm doing it sort of dafka to show that Zionism was for most of the Zionist leadership, not all of them, not for Buber, for example, but for most of them was a political movement. It was about regaining and being able to have political military control over territory people. That's what Zionism was. The issue today is, okay, now that you have that, with all of its burdens and responsibilities and the crucible of what that means right now, um, is that all that Zionism in Israel was about, being a sanctuary, a safe haven, a place where we could play out certain ideas and ideals, or is it supposed to be something more than that for the world? So I don't say post-Zionist, but I will say sort of a Zionist renaissance, of, and that this announcement today is about can Israel mean something for the world in terms of its values. Not just can it politically be a good democratic nation in a bad neighborhood, which as you know is no small thing, no small thing, but can it actually um, you know, have light radi out, radiate out into the world in terms of its values and have a positive impact on the world greater than, well, we sent doctors to Haiti or wherever. 
That was me mocking my friends in the foreign ministry. Right? Are we gonna are we gonna actually be something for the world beyond being something for ourselves? We were so busy saving ourselves, and we still are, if you think about our borders and, and some of the military issues, but we're so focused on saving ourselves, and now actually so rich, so powerful, so secure despite everything, can we actually be something for the world too? So I hope that was a response to at least two of your questions, but we can, we can go ahead. Are there a couple of other questions? Yeah. Correct. And the question within the context of, of, of your very good talk is where does that notion rank in terms of importance in the reform movement today in comparison to Zionism? Um, certainly I understand that Israel is in many ways the locus or one of the most important locuses of the Jewish people, but yet it's not the only one. I, as an American Jew, mm -hmm. certainly feel a, a connection and, a, and an empathy with Israel. But I also feel a connection and empathy with Jews in other countries. Um, when I read about anti-Semitism in France or Hungary, for example. Right. Or the Ukraine right now. Absolutely. Which was where my family came from. I react in the same visceral way. Am I missing something? What's your name? Jim. Jim. You're such a good Jew. What a great question. I'm calling him such a good Jew because I'm from the Ukraine too. My family's from the Ukraine too. Probably We're probably related. <laughs> and I was telling Rabbi Davidson, the cab driver who I argued with about the price and everything and the way he went as we argued the whole way, I felt like I was in Israel. Then it turns out he's a Jew from the Ukraine too. And he did it to a lonsman. Then, of course, I had to tip him well. You know, I mean, it was one of these terrible things. Anyway, so, uh, so Jews love to argue about these things. But here's the thing about your initial statement about Am Yisrael and peoplehood. Peoplehood as a term in English uh, is really only thanks to Mordechai Kaplan. It's quite modern and recent. The Jewish people is really, you know, um, which technically means Am Yisrael and B'nai Yisrael and all these terms. There are multiple terms in the Bible that pretty much refer to the same thing. And yes, should we have loyalty to them wherever we are? Absolutely. In fact, I would say Zionism was about um, serving and saving Am Yisrael. Serving and saving Am Yisrael. Um, not to the exclusion of anybody or any place. The World Union for Progressive Judaism, all of us ought to be equally concerned about what's happening. I'm actually quite nervous about what's happening for the Jews in Ukraine right now and lots of other places. Um, we should be equally concerned about them. Um, I was looking at particularly at the question of this, uh, this nationalist idea of Zionism and what it's meant for us religiously, politically, spiritually, uh, and in terms of Jewish peoplehood, I'm arguing that it has taught us about our commitment to Jewish peoplehood in a way that we might not have otherwise had it, but to, to not have a commitment to the state of Israel and to the Jewish people and an engagement with the spiritual ideas of Judaism. To miss one of those elements is to miss a crucial aspect. Uh, was that a, I, th I hope that was a helpful clarification. In other words, we agree. <laughs> um, but Jewish peoplehood, I just want to say one more word about Jewish peoplehood, uh, since you heard I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in it. Um, Jewish peoplehood, and I noticed this even from our applications to rabbinic school, and Rabbi Davidson and I are sitting on an admissions committee together tomorrow. Um, we have a greater sense of commitment amongst our religious leadership to Jewish peoplehood than we do to anything else right now. In a recent survey we, uh, we conducted with our own sociologist, Stephen, Professor Stephen Cohen, um, when you ask about Israel or God or anything else, top, like way above commitments to anything else, is Jewish peoplehood. So something for this generation and Jewish peoplehood has gone right. I would say when it comes to Israel, for lots of understandable reasons, and when it comes to God, which I was getting at, we haven't done a very good job. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that all of those core aspects of Judaism um, have, a, have a clear commitment, certainly amongst our leaders. Should we take one more question? Yeah. 
We want to help them. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's a great question about where our, where our rabbinic students are today in, the, in terms of the question of Israel and support and critique of Israel. Among the liberal seminaries, we actually have the highest across the board what I would call centrist support of Israel, which I think is very, very interesting given what I said about the broad umbrella. We have increasing numbers of students who are engaged um, with the leadership, not to put this at the far left at all, but it's sort of the left side of our tent, engaged in J Street. And we also have increasing numbers of students and colleagues involved in APAC, right? So, um, and we have internships with both of them, and we have, you know, this, so I would, I would say we're in a wonderfully positive relationship with Israel. I think, um, you know, the same people who criticized, uh, you know, very critical rabbinic student, critical of Israel rabbinic students actually couldn't find enough reform rabbinic students to make that argument, couldn't find enough overly critical of Israel rabbinic students to make that same argument, uh, which I think makes sense if you, uh, in the context of what I said about our positions on Israel and the positions uh, of our leadership and, and the president of our seminary on Israel. Um, and yet, we have worked very hard as a faculty. I was on the faculty of our Jerusalem school for uh, almost a decade. We have worked very hard to maintain a pluralist atmosphere, right? A student who comes and feels that they have to take a centrist, what I'll call a centrist supportive of the government position on Israel, I think will be very unhappy in our school. I think it's important that our, you can find faculty um, and advisors within the institution that embrace a very broad range of opinions. We've had, you know, rabbis and faculty people uh, who've been refuseniks, Israelis who've refused to serve in the, Israel, in the occupied territories, okay? Um, you know, and people whose, you know, parents and, uh, and grandparents have been centrist and rightist uh, thinkers and leaders on Israel. So the fact that we can have a faculty uh, that embraces that broad of a spectrum, I think, allows our students to, to feel comfortable. Um, what I will say uh, is that I, will, I think it's a much more thoughtful on Israel's student body over the last decade. If I compare what our students are saying today, regardless of what they're saying, but the, the thoughtfulness and the knowledge, uh, the knowledge base of what they're saying today to be at a much higher level uh, than what we saw uh, 10 and 15 years ago. So we must be doing something right. And with that, <laughs> thank you. Let me just say a, a, a word of thanks um, to you, um, Rabbi Doctor. <laughs> you can just say right. a lot for, for helping us um, understand the development of our movement's thinking in our relationship to Israel, which in so many ways helps us also give context to the to the struggles we still have when we think about our universalist commitments and our particularist commitments today, seeing that that debate that many of us have today is really part of a continuum, a very conscientious, conscious thought that our movement has, has um, been engaged with for so long is, is truly enriching. And to hear you inspires us knowing that the future leadership of the American Jewish community is going to be wonderful because you are going to lead us in ushering that leadership through the halls of synagogues like this uh, around the country and institutions that will build the, the liberal Judaism of which we are so proud. So we're so grateful to you, Thank you, as I am to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.